what I'm talking about. Um, so that a dieseling is when the engine kind of goes, <laughs> you try and turn it off, and it just kind of keeps going. <laughs> That's what I'll do for a minute here while we're waiting for Cheryl. Um, the, the hymn that we're singing after the sermon today is not one that most of you are going to be familiar with. And so apologies in advance for being so bold as to pick an unfamiliar hymn. But the reason I picked it is because the, the words are so beautiful and they really will fit, as you'll see, they'll fit the reading from John 17 very well. Cheryl, come on up. And no trouble at all, no apology <laughs> necessary. If you weren't here, there was something important going on. I can guarantee that. Anything else before we, yeah, go ahead, Fred, that's right. That is in, in process, we're, plan, we're making plans, council is talking about it, and Doug's, uh, Doug Fugge, I'm not sure wherever you are, you're working on that. So that's coming down the pipe, we look forward to it. Uh, lastly, before we begin, uh, we do have a few guests here this morning, welcome to Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. Um, I'm going to assume that some of you may have not uh, be familiar with a Lutheran worship service. Um, so let me just kind of give you a couple of pro tips about um, our bulletin. Generally, uh, no, not generally, I think this is, well, for the most part, it is true. If it's in bold type, you're invited to speak it out loud. If it's not in bold type, it will be I, speak, I who's speaking or um, another reader who's doing the speaking. So uh, like, for instance, at the psalm, when we get to the psalm, um, you'll see it's back and forth. There's some some 
typeface, which is regular, and then there's some bold, and that's when you're encouraged to respond with the bold reading. And then uh, the hymns are printed in here. If you don't know them, um, enjoy. Uh, you know, sing along if you can, uh, or or just follow along. And then occasionally there's a stand or a sit. I'll usually make a, a some kind of note uh, verbally as to when to stand and when to sit. Um, but the main thing I'd like you to know about our worship service is that um, uh, we're gathered here by the power of God uh, to worship him. And uh, so he is the, at the center of our worship, and he is our, our reason and our cause. Uh, so um, if, uh, if you've come uh, expecting anything else, at least know this, that what, what we pray that you will experience is meaningful and inspiring uh, according to his will, not our own. So uh, anyway, welcome to our guests. Happy Mother's Day to about half of you. <laughs> Let's stand and, and worship.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated, and at this time I invite our baptismal party to come forward. Join me. If you would stand on this side of the font facing the congregation, then they get to watch the action. Mm -hmm. um, I, did you all catch the uh, language in that opening hymn? Uh, I'm not sure whether you all did or not, but uh, a couple lines from verse 3. Verse 3 in the hymn we just sang refers to baptism as the means by which God has made us his own. And so one of the things that's taking place here is that through the mystery of baptism, um, God is laying a claim today, and he's laying a claim on, on Liam. So, uh, and then in the verse 4, it says that, uh, it, you know, the first words, here stands the font before our eyes, telling how God has received all of us. And so, uh, if nothing else, as you are witnesses of this baptism this morning, remember that what's happening to Liam has happened to you. And that you had just exactly as much to do with it as he does. Salvation is God's act on our behalf. It is not something we do. So you'll see that played out here in our, in our, uh, in our baptismal liturgy. But we begin uh, first with a kind of a commission. The, um, well, I referred to this in my sermon this morning also. The, the uh, Great Commission is in the, uh, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 28. And it's where Jesus is standing in front of his disciples. Now his disciples in that moment in history, his disciples are the entire Christian church on earth. There's tw it's a 12-member church on earth. That's all there is to it. And he stands there and he says to them, make disciples of all nations, of all people. And he means young, old, no matter what their race or, or no matter what their gender, no matter what, make disciples of them. And then he says, here's how you're going to do it. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe everything that I've taught you. And so the process of increasing the church, the process of expanding the church, of making more and more disciples, takes place exactly how Jesus says it does, through baptism and then through teaching. Now the teaching part, um, well, that's why he made you Liam's parents. Because that's your primary task, or primarily that's your task. I think both of those statements are true. Your primary, hi Liam, your primary task as parents is to raise him in faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and in all the world, there is no one more called to that than his mother and his father. So, um, uh, among other things this morning, and I'll, uh, in a few moments I'll be asking you to confess your faith in, in the biblical God. Um, if, if nothing else, this is also a moment for you guys to just kind of be reminded of what an incredible calling it is to be a parent. Um, it's a lot of work, um, but um, God has made you his missionaries in Liam's life. It's fantastic. So, uh, congratulations on that. Um, so anyway, that's Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. Now, um, it is also customary. Uh, this is kind of an ancient tradition of the church. Did you know that people usually didn't name their children until baptism? You know, that was an old, old tradition. We didn't do that in this case. <laughs> Not too many people do. Um, but in, in uh, it, you know, part of that tradition, what they used to say is that at, at your baptism, your name is spoken in heaven for the first time. So we kind of carry that tradition a little bit forward and we say, uh, we ask you, mom and dad, how is this child to be named? And you say, all right, Liam Austin Denton, receive the sign of the cross both on your forehead and upon your heart. This marks you as one redeemed by the cross of Jesus Christ and the work that he did there. And so to uh, invoke uh, the power of God into your life, we pray together as he has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I prayed that prayer with my kids every night at bedtime until they were too cool for dad to come in for bedtime. Um, all right, so um, we now ask you now, so Liam's too young to confess his own faith. We know that. That doesn't make him any less able to trust Look, just look at how he's clinging to his father. Babies trust. And so what he is receiving today in baptism is the capacity to trust his Lord and God. And um, that Lord and God is the Lord and God of the Bible. And so in order to uh, 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 you know, invoke his name and his ministry, and in order to assure this body that uh, we are baptizing him into the biblical God, we are going to ask his primary teachers a few questions. Did you study? No. no <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> Believe me, you know these questions. You know these answers. So I'll ask you, and you can answer. Um, typically, the answer is going to be yes. However, if the answer is no, by all means, tell me no. We'll just be here for a while if you do. <laughs> um, do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? Okay, so that's good. Um, do you believe in, G in God the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth? Yes. And do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and buried, who descended into hell and on the third day rose again from the dead, who ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. It's a long question. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes. And do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? Yes. yes. Congregation, do you believe in those things? Yes. And do you desire for Liam to be baptized this day? You do. So let's do that. Um, would you like to hold him or shall I? Oh, well, that's a privilege. Okay. Hi, Liam. Hi. I'm Pastor Sparling. Yeah, he, there's mom and dad. All right. Liam Austin, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. should see the look on his face. <laughs> Hallelujah. There he is. The newest member of the kingdom of heaven. There you go. All right, let's pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given new birth of water and the spirit and forgiven all of Liam's sins. We pray that you would strengthen him in grace to life everlasting in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, a uh, couple of things we have in here for, uh, for you. I think you can keep that. Um, uh, we've got a, um, oh, and this also, but uh, this is one, the one I'm excited about. This is um, a candle, obviously. But I'm going to light it because I don't want you to turn this into a keepsake in a drawer somewhere. And I'll explain. I'm going to light this. Now, see that tall candle over there? In the church, we refer to that as the Christ candle. Uh, symbolically, uh, it represents the presence of Jesus Christ in our midst. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to light this candle. This is your baptismal candle. And um, now it's lit. So that means it's used. All right. We'll bur it'll burn for a minute or two, and then I'll put it out, and I'll give it to you. What I'd like to invite you to do, if you can remember, every year on the anniversary of his baptism, light the candle and tell him 
the story of what happened today. Tell him who was here. All the family that came from as far away as Texas. Is that, is that the farthest away we've got here is Texas? Who wins, who wins from Texas? Thank you for being Oh, a lot of you. All right, tell, tell him who was here and tell him who his family is. But more than that, tell him, look, he's already reaching for it. Tell him the story of what God has done for him that God suffered and died for him so that he might have everlasting life. Now, each year, if you'll do that, if you'll light the candle and tell him the story and then extinguish the candle, over the years, the candle will burn down. See, it's not a keepsake. That stuff you can have as a keepsake. This is a teaching tool. And as the candle burns away, the faith will begin to burn in his own heart. And that's the goal, okay? So this is for you. You please use it. Dad, there you go. Take those, and you may return to your seats. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And amen. Are you going to wield a... Yeah, thank you. You could do that. In our worship, uh, as our worship continues, um, I'm going to invite you to stand as we confess our sins. And I want you to observe that after the reading of the gospel where we would normally have the creed, we'll skip that since we just had the creed in part of our baptismal service. So uh, we continue then at, at the uh, text there called the Invocation and Exhortation. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we confess our sins to God, our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for each and every one of you and for his sake forgives you all your sin. Therefore as called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray, O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the Spirit of truth whom you promised from the Father, for you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 12 through 26. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olive, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all of about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all of his bowels gushed out and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language Akaldama that is field of blood for it is written in the book of Psalms may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office So one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for him, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteousness. For the Lord knows the way of the... uh, (laughs) I think we skipped a page. Did I? Maybe. There you go. Start. Sorry. Uh, Psalm 1 reads responsibly by verse. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, 
The first epistle comes from John chapter 5, verse 9 through 15. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. This is the word of the Lord.
Now we hear the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Jesus, praying, says, While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world in the same way I am not of this world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, If you joined us late, by the way, the reason we didn't uh, confess our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed is because we had a baptism this morning and we, we, uh, we recited the creed during that. So lest you think I skipped that by mistake or on purpose, it would be even worse. So anyway, the word of God that engages us in meditation this morning is the gospel lesson that I just read. And uh, in that gospel lesson, Jesus lays out for us his mission in the world. And then by laying out his mission in the world, he also lays out for the apostles what their mission is in the world. And if you think about it, the the context here is the night before he's going to be crucified, he's praying for these apostles. And um, if you think about it right there, I mean, this is the fledgling Christian church. Before it's even the Christian church. He hasn't risen from the dead yet. He hasn't been crucified. But these 12 disciples are going to become the first members of the Christian church. They're going to become the first pastors of the Christian church. And from those 12, miraculously, over the course of a couple of hundred years, this thing explodes all over the uh, Mediterranean and then and out into the world. And so uh, the outline for this morning is, uh, first of all, what is the ministry of Jesus Christ during his time? What, secondly, then, what, what is the ministry of the apostles? And then the third is going to be a surprise. That's, that's a trick there. Keep them on their toes. Make sure they're still listening. Um, not that you have a problem with that. I know, Alan, you'll be... Anyway, so um, this is often referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer. Have you ever heard uh, John 17 referred to as the high priestly prayer of Jesus? You have. Okay. The reason they call it that is because... Uh, it says it right in there. In fact, that I didn't unpack that for you when I was reading it. But on that very first uh, sentence when Jesus says, While I was with them, I kept them in your name. I have guarded them. And not one of them has been lost except for Judas. He's obviously talking about the disciples. And so... If we imagine that the disciples are the original 12 priests or pastors, I'm going to use that term interchangeably in here. Um, If we imagine them, then Jesus is among them as their high priest. In order to see that, we really want to uh, rewind ourselves back and understand what exactly it is that the priesthood was designed for to begin with. And in order to do that, uh, we're just going to head back into the Old Testament. And without uh, quoting a bunch of uh, scriptures, I'm just going to tell you, I am going to take everything that I've learned about the priesthood in the Old Testament and just kind of uh, distill it for you here in a, in a few paragraphs. The priesthood, their entire role, their purpose, was what really boiled down to one sentence, actually. I could do it that way. Their job was to to speak to God on behalf of the sinful humanity. 
Their job was to go before God and to offer the sacrifices and to offer the prayers, not for their own sake, but for the sake of some other people who had brought in the sacrifice that they had wanted. Let's say the family had, had chosen the, their spotless you know, lamb and they brought it in for the, for the atonement of the sins of their family. And so they would bring in the lamb, the priest would take the lamb and he would conduct the sacrifice. He would do all of the activity inside the tabernacle. In fact, the people who had brought the, the lamb for sacrifice, they weren't even allowed inside the tent. They were only allowed at the entrance, what they called the entrance of the tent of meeting, which would have been not just the, the opening, but a few feet in where the altar was. That was considered the entrance of the tent. They couldn't go any further than that. From there, as you drew nearer and nearer to the presence of the, ho the holy presence of God, which was um, in the midst of the tabernacle, and then there was, a, there was a courtyard and there was the tent, and then inside the tent was this little, another tent, if you will, and inside there, that was the very holy presence of God among them. It's what they, what they called where the mercy seat, that's where the covenant of the, uh, the, the law was, was kept and all that, the Ark of the Covenant. So that was the presence of God. And the priesthood then mediated between God and the sinful humanity. Their role was to stand before God on behalf of the people and appeal to God for the atonement of their sins. That's the priesthood. Now, it's important to start there because all, um, probably all of us, very likely, that all of us have in the course of our lives, with the exception of Liam, all of us have encountered bad examples of the priesthood. I've been a pretty good example so far today, so I can say except for Liam. Um, Though I have to say, I, even, my, even my, my, myself, even within my ministry, I have at times been a bad example of the priesthood. Um, so you, some of you, maybe you, you've had a miserable experience inside a Christian church with a priest or a pastor who badly abused his office. And maybe, there's a, maybe that's one of the main reasons why you don't like to go to church or don't even believe in God for that matter was because you encountered a, a, a priest or a pastor who didn't properly fulfill his duty. His duty was to guard and keep you at, by going to the Holy Lord God on your behalf and begging for your forgiveness. That's the role of the priesthood throughout the Old Testament. And so Jesus now is behaving in that way. Did you see how he explains to, uh, well, he's, he's praying, but we get to hear it. So he's explaining to us his idea of what his ministry was. He says, I have kept them and I have guarded them. Now those two words are big power words in the Bible. In fact, I wonder, I'm just going to ask for a show of hands. If I say the words guarded and kept, how many of you can think of another place in the Bible where those two words appear together, guarded and kept? Anyone got a guess? It's in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And of course, it depends on what translation you're reading. But it says there in Genesis 2, 15, that the Lord God put Adam into the garden in order to guard it and keep it. To guard it and keep it. Now, what does this mean? This means that, that Adam, who is in this case sort of representing all of us, humanity was created by God and then commissioned by God to be good stewards of God's creation, to guard and keep everything that God has made, which in our case includes each other, right? And so Adam and Eve, their whole job was to guard and keep God's creation. That's what it says in Genesis 2.15. And we know that as the story goes, that they didn't do a good job of that. They became corrupt priests <laughs> in the temple of God. That's what the garden was. Uh, it was the dwelling place of God on earth. And, and so, uh, for instance, the, the, the way that Adam and Eve was, were to guard and keep inside the garden was that 
one of the one of the ways was that God said you can eat whatever you want, eat whatever you want, eat that, eat that, eat whatever you want, um, except this particular tree and this particular fruit from this particular tree. That's not for food. Don't eat that one. That was their whole Bible. <laughs> so you could put their print their whole Bible on a on a fortune cookie. You know, don't eat from the fruit of that tree. And so um, uh, that's unfortunately what they did. And so you see, they failed to guard and keep God's creation. They failed to guard and keep God's creation. So when Jesus says, "I have guarded and kept everyone you've given me." What Jesus is saying is, I am redoing everything that has been undone by sinful, fallen humanity. Because from the moment that Adam and Eve fail to guard and keep, according to the, the, the word of God, and uh, from the moment of that failure, um, the world begins to unwind in front of us. And Look, if, if you're someone who has been harmed by the church, you, you, you're suffering the consequences of sinful, fallen humanity. Even if you haven't suffered at the hands of the priesthood, you've suffered at the hands of someone. Um, an abusive spouse, or a worse, an abusive parent, I suppose, could be worse. Um, an abusive boss or, or employer. Um, you've suffered from the results of, of disease. Uh, you've grieved the bitter results of death. Uh, we live in a world that is suffering the consequences of our failure to guard and keep what God has made. Now, our Bible's a little longer than a fortune cookie. I mean, uh, you, at, at least at bare minimum, 10 fortune cookies, right? <laughs> you got the 10 commandments. And if you just boil it down to that, we're not even really guarding and keeping that. It's out of our own mouths that come the, the kind of gossip or the, the hatred that, that God commands against, uh, against in the 5th and the 8th commandment. It's in, our, it's in our own minds, or dare I say, it's in our browser history on our computer. Those of us who click too often on things we ought not to click, that God has commanded against in the sixth commandment, you know? Um, we're, we're not only victims of sinful, fallen humanity, we are sinful, fallen humanity. Every one of us. And what we need is a priest who will guard and keep us. We need someone who will make argument on our behalf before the Lord God to atone for our sins. To say, Lord God, you promised to offer forgiveness when blood will be shed in their behalf. Now forgive them. That's what the priest did. They brought their lamb. The priest would take the lamb and... and and spill the blood in the right possible places and, and take the fatty portions and put them on the altar and, and burn them, turn them into smoke. And, and you know, and then the, the, the Bible says that when all of this was taking place, that God would sort of like smell the aroma and it would be a pleasing aroma in the nostrils of God. <laughs> Sometimes the Bible talks about God as if he had a human face. And, uh, and the, the main point is that through the shedding of the blood of the innocent lamb, the, the, the sins of that family were forgiven and atoned for. And that was the priest's role. And that's what we need. We need a priest who will faithfully do that, who won't mess it up like I do sometimes. And that's what Jesus says he has been for the apostles. I have kept them in your name, which you have given me, and I have guarded them. And not one of them has been lost, except for Judas. And we're not going to preach about the role of Judas in this morning's sermon. What was Jesus' mission on earth? It was to choose these 12 disciples. 
and to treat them as his church, to treat them as people who needed to be made holy through the forgiveness of sins that God has promised if blood would be shed on their behalf. And Jesus didn't merely speak the prayer on their behalf. He shed the blood on their behalf. What was Jesus' ministry on earth? To guard and to keep. And that's what he did. So his disciples, and then it, later in, the, in the, the reading, it says, just as you, he, this is still Jesus talking, and he's praying to the Father in heaven. He says, in the same way that you have sent me, I now send them. Now I want you to know... Um, the language of sending is the language of mission. The Latin there is missio, the m mission, send, to be sent. And so the disciples are sent. I quoted it earlier in the baptismal uh, liturgy. I said that when the last thing Jesus said to his disciples is, I, I'm sending you out into all the world to make disciples, to, to grow this thing called the Christian church. So in other words, he made them to be priests. As Jesus was sent, he says, so I'm sending them. So the role, uh, the role of the apostles was to guard and keep. To guard and keep. In other words, the role of the, the disciples was to undo the mess of the world and the sin and the grief and the guilt and shame that comes with it to, to interact with a world who desperately needs a priest, someone to intercede for them on their behalf, someone to, to share with them the fact that blood has been shed for them and that God has accepted that as atonement for their sin and that they too can now walk in newness of life. And that's how Jesus has then sent the apostles. And he just sent them out into the world to do that. And by golly, over the next 200 years, this thing exploded. So that's point one and that's point two. You ready for the surprise? The surprise comes, I'm cheating, in a verse that wasn't included in the, t in the bulletin. It's the very next verse. Why did they leave that out of the reading, Mary? Why? Cody, the pericoplists are our enemies. Remember that. All right, anyway, that's a... Silly theological joke. Um, let me read it for you. Jesus continues saying, My prayer is not for them alone. I am also praying for those who will believe in me through their message. Who's he talking about, Laylee? Yeah, D. You got it. Jesus, get this. Folks, I, if, ignore everything I've said and focus on what I'm about to say. <laughs> on the night before Jesus suffered and died, the penalty of sin, on the night before he suffered and died on the cross, he prayed and he prayed for you. You and I are the ones who have believed based on on the testimony of the apostles. How else did we find out about the death and resurrection of Jesus if not through the gospel of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and the writings of Paul and all what the apostles did and wrote down, they recorded and they wrote their eyewitness testimony and passed it down to the extent that now to this very day we rely on what they've said for what we believe which means that Jesus is not only praying for 12 apostles, he's praying for you, Mary, and for you, Michelle, who did a fantastic job of reading this morning. Michelle, that was your first time, right, Michelle? I am so thankful. And Michelle, now I'm going to make an example of you. Because, we, because if... <laughs> because here's the thing. If... 
what Jesus has done in his high priestly prayer is hand the ministry to the disciples, essentially saying, now I'll be the high priest and you be the priests. Now you're a, a priesthood to the world. If that's what he's saying is true about the apostles, and he's not just praying about the apostles, but he's also praying about us, what Jesus is saying is that every single one of us is a priest in the kingdom of God. Every single one one of us, has, the, has been sent, has the mission, the holy calling to, to cry out to God on behalf of the sinful fallen world. And this morning, Michelle, you got to participate in that. I hope you had a great, while you were reading, I was praying, oh Lord, bless Michelle that she have the same joy in serving in this house that I get every single Sunday. And I pray that you had that joy. And why did I pray that? I'm just praying the same prayer that Jesus prayed. Did you check that out? Jesus says, um, i got to find it. Uh, yeah, uh, now I am coming to you, he says to the Father, I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy in themselves, fulfilled in themselves. Now, what's that joy? It's Hebrews chapter 12, where, Jesus, where, where the writer to the, to, the, to the Hebrews says that Jesus, for the joy set before him, suffered the cross, enduring its shame. He scorned its shame. He endured the cross. It says that when, it's, here's what, the, what Hebrews 12 is saying, that when, Jesus saw God's plan for, for your salvation. When Jesus saw the plan, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to be born into the world and I'm going to have to suffer and I'm going to have to die and I'm going to have to be cast into hell so that all of these people don't have to be. Hey, he, you know what his response was? Joy. Joy. How could that be unless he loves you? Unless he loves us all. And so um, that's why, Michelle, I pray that you have that joy fulfilled in you. And I'm going to pray that prayer for every single one of you. That as you begin to realize that what, jo what Jesus says in John chapter 17 is not merely, it is this at least, but it's more than this. It's at least this, that he himself has become the forgiveness of your sins. That when he suffered and died, he's cleaned up the mess that you and I have made by failing to guard and keep, by failing to be the good stewards of the creation that God has put us in. That he has become the propitiation for our sins. Another big word that, that Paul uses. He has become our atonement, our forgiveness. He's not merely saying that. He's also saying that each and every single one of us now is part of his mission. So, now I'll, I'll speak to you individually. Um, I'm guessing that only one of us, maybe to some extent, a few more of us, but uh, I'll roll with it. Uh, probably only one of us came to church this morning thinking, hmm, it's time to fulfill my priestly duty. And that's the guy standing in front of you right now. I definitely had that in mind when I came here. Hmm, time to go fulfill my priestly duty. But do you know, that's what should be on your mind as well. Now, I know that you come here, and a lot of you, you, you carry your burdens in here, and you come to worship so that, you, so that you can have God sort of directly address you, directly address your own guilt and your own burdens and your own anxieties and your own fears and, and all of the guilt of the stuff that you drag in here, and you want to have a, a transactional moment with God where the, the prayers are made, and the sins are forgiven and communion is taken and you have forgiveness of sins and newness of life. I know you came in at least for that, but come for more than that. I want you to drag the world's problems in here. I want you to come in as priests, caring for the world around you, 
Hall County, Gainesville, Georgia, the United States and the world, and to care so deeply about what they're struggling because it's a sinful fallen world that you will drag their problems in here and cast them before the merciful Lord, their, our God, on their behalf so that you can also be guarding and keeping them because that's what we're sent to do to guard and keep. And look, um, I don't do it perfectly and I'm called and ordained and installed to do it. Um, so I don't expect any of you to do it perfectly. But you don't have to worry about doing it perfectly because all the while that's, that we're doing it, Jesus is our great high priest who stands forever before the throne of God making intercessions on our behalf. Well, okay, I just quoted Hebrews again. Let me uh, explain just to you what that means. It means that Jesus continues to be your high priest and to continue to forgive your sins and to continue to give you the strength and to continue to deliver to you the joy that comes in, in being sent to do his work. So, as I address you this morning as a congregation, I'm also addressing you as a community of priests. Every single one of you. To guard, to keep this world that God has put you in because you are guarded and kept by the one who has put you here. Amen.
I invite you to stand as we pray. O oh Lord God, Heavenly King, you've gathered us again before your presence. Grant that we may dwell in your house all the days of our lives and gaze upon your beauty manifested here in your word and sacrament. Receive us as we inquire in your temple, Lord, in your mercy. O oh, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you sent your Son into the world as he sent his apostles, so now also send us, so that the world may know your name and the salvation that comes by it. Lord, in your mercy. Since it is your will that we pray for all in authority, we believe with confidence that you hear our prayers for our president, for our governor, our Congress, legislature, and our judges. Teach them the testimony of the truth so that they may be wise and effective in their offices. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. You've testified that eternal life is given in your son that whoever has him has life. And you also promise that you'll hear whatever we ask according to your will. So comfort and help the sick and the distressed. Heal them. Give life to, to those who hold your son in faithful hearts. Lord, in your mercy. And Heavenly Father, your Son, in his incarnation, took on our human flesh, being born of the Virgin Mary. He submitted to his mother, honoring her, obeying her, and fulfilling the commandment where we have not. And so on this Mother's Day, accept our thanksgiving for our mothers whom you have given to us. Teach us to honor them aright, loving, obeying, and giving thanks for them, as is fitting in your sight. Strengthen all women with child and give them safe delivery. Comfort those women who long to have children but cannot, that they may find their consolation in you and in your unfailing love. We ask it through the same Jesus Christ who teaches us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord be with you. 